in the fan. Welcome to your commercial-free, uninterrupted investment show, sponsored by the SEC Registered Investment Firm, Wilsey Asset Management, a fiduciary firm owned and operated by President Brent Wilsey, who has been putting clients' investment needs first for over 40 years. The Smart Investing Show has been giving unbiased financial information for over 27 years on local radio stations right here in San Diego providing you with fundamental analysis on stocks and investments you want to know about. Now, here are your hosts, Brent and Chase Wilsey. Well, hello and welcome to the Smart Investing Show. I'm Brent Wilsey, president of Wilsey Asset Management. Great to have you here with the Smart Investing Show. Got a lot of things to cover, cover today. Some great information came out uh, on the jobs report we're going to go with the jobs report and also the JOLTS report, which comes out prior to that. And JOLTS is Job Opening Labor Turnover Survey. Talking about oil prices and also investment returns is what we'll cover for you this morning. And then great to have you back, Chase. <laughs> hey, good to be back. And uh, as always, you want to join the show. <clears throat> Phone number here is 833-288-0973. Again, that's 833-288-0973. you got a stock. We call them equities, companies you're looking at buying, selling, or holding. We'll break down those fundamentals and, and give you our opinion on that stock. And yeah, I got to say, gosh, it's, it's great to be back. You know, the first Saturday I was gone on a business trip and then um, I don't think I made the announcement yet on the show, I but have, um, yeah. Yeah, I found out my wife and I were, were having our first kid in February. And one thing we always talked about was we wanted to go to Europe before we yes. started having a family because I've never been. And all of a sudden, we're like, oh my gosh, we're pregnant. We got to the trip. <laughs> got to go. So, <laughs> we were in Europe the last couple of weeks there, which was uh, a lot of fun. Got home last night. Luggage didn't make it back, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm here, which is, is which nice, to be, nice to be back here. And then, yeah, next Saturday, I'm gone because financial planner Harrison's getting married and I'm his best man. So, I got to yes. be there for the rehearsal dinner. Yes, yes. So, and I believe you said something this morning before I saw you go, I love the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I missed it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I like this country. I, I like the businesses we have yes. here. You know, I, I I like my job, so I like working. <laughs> I still got to do a lot of reading while I was away, which was which was great to catch up on things. But um, yeah, no, I miss being here. Well, well, let's get you right back into it because the jobs report uh, has been released, <clears throat> and the, the the September jobs report was released uh, on Friday, October sixth. And at first glance, it was scary because it was so good. But then as the day moved on, the report was analyzed further and positive information was found. What was scary about the report was 336,000 jobs were created, twice as much as expected. Uh, this caused concern that there would be a definite increase in interest rates in November by the Fed. Also giving more concern was the July and August numbers were revised higher, 119,000 total. But as the day progressed and the numbers were analyzed, it was understood that the average hourly earnings had only increased two or zero point two percent, which is below the expected zero point three percent. Now, this is the mildest number we have seen over the last eighteen months. The Federal Reserve has been concerned about wage growth, and this report is proof there should be no concern on that wage growth. The strength in the job market was seen in leisure and hospitality, healthcare, professional, scientific, and technical services. What the report is revealing is that we can increase people working, but yet wages are not getting out of hand, which is something the Federal Reserve was concerned about. Now, the Consumer Price Index, which is the gauge on inflation that is, I'm going to say, most followed uh, by uh, individual investors at this point, that'll be released next Thursday, October 12th. And, and based on what we're seeing here at Wilsey Asset Management, we believe it'll be a good report. And if that holds true, we could be done with any more rate increases for the rest of 2023, which raises the green flag to invest in the right equities here. And, and actually, there's these... Uh, studies, or uh, I, I'm, I'm not getting the right word here, but but based on the odds uh, that the Fed will increase rates, and they're now down about 40, 45 percent for November and December, which is a positive. Uh, and I still don't see any reason why he would raise rates. And I, I know <clears throat> they have again what's called the dot plot, which yeah. is the expectations from the Fed of what's going to happen. And the dot plot showed that we're going to have maybe two more increases through the re the end of this year. And I I just don't see the reason for that. And it's so funny. I I don't. It might have been a couple of weeks. You know, I've, I've been been away here for a little bit. <laughs> You're off track a little bit. But uh, I believe we did a post on the <clears> Fed <throat> uh, and how wrong they were in twenty was it. 2021 when they said it was transitory and their yeah. dot plot showed that interest is going to be flat and here we are today with the fed funds rate over you know five and a half percent we'll call yep. it 
that I think should be what we see again on the opposite side where I don't think that dot pot is going to be accurate. I, I just don't see any reason to increase it. And I, I've been thinking a lot too about the number of jobs being created. And I've said this before, but I think that could actually be good for inflation because what could happen is we could increase the supply out there of goods and services. You increase the supply mm-hmm. of goods and services. That helps with costs, prices, Rather than, yeah, if wages spiral and become problematic, that is something I think the Fed should keep an eye on. But I don't necessarily think that higher jobs being created necessarily is always going to be bad for inflation. And you're right, too, because the problem with higher wages is that that could cause too much money chasing too few goods. You're saying, like, well, if we create too many goods and there's not as much wages chasing them, they'll bring down prices. And and that's a very simple economic uh, concept, which works very well. So I've I've talked about this before, especially on the service side. And I I used the example of, you know, I think I got my haircut. I need to go get my haircut next week. Yeah, it looks pretty bad (laughs) there. (laughs) (laughs) Is if you have more barbers, more hairdressers out there, Well, that's more competition. They're going to have more out there. It's not necessarily that, oh, well, now you're going to have to pay that person more to cut hair. No, there's more of that service available. That's good for the supply of that particular service. And, of course, you extrapolate that across different areas of the economy as well. I I just don't think having more jobs always translates to higher inflation. Yeah, and I guess it depends on those jobs. And, yeah, it is a positive because the big concern was – the service sector, yeah. and if your 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 barber analysis is so good, because yeah, if you have more barbers cutting hair, they're gonna say, well, hey, I'm gonna reduce my prices because I want to increase my business. I'm sitting here doing nothing. I'm charging I don't know twenty five dollars for a haircut. Gee, if I charge maybe twenty, uh, I'll do ten haircuts versus two. Yeah. So that that can bring down prices because of the competition on services, and that was one of Powell's big concerns was the service side. So that is showing positive signs. And actually, I even saw good reports uh, that it's not out yet, but consumer spending, they're saying that's going to look good. So we, I, I, I think this last quarter is going to be a very good quarter for investors in the right equity. So always got to say the right equity. And, and I do think the other thing as well <laughs> about more jobs being created is that a big factor that I've seen is it's more people coming back to the workforce. Yeah. I, again, think that's a positive thing for inflation. The reason for that is all of a sudden you don't have people that – want to come back to the labor market. Well, you're going to have to pay people very well to attract them to those jobs. All of a sudden, you increase the labor pool, there's actually more competition out there for workers. That's the big problem right now is we haven't had enough workers to fulfill the amount of goods and services that are needed, so you have to pay up for those. All of a sudden, you bring back more workers in, that creates more competition. It kind of gives a little bit more tilt towards the employer, towards the businesses, where the employees have had the huge upper hand over the last couple of years. Right. And also, too, if you're working, you're not going to be out there spending as much money because you're at the office or – and more people are going back to the office, by the way, so that, that's a positive there. But you're not going to be out. And, and well, I drive by, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, this place over by our, our office. It's a breakfast place. And, like, at 1030, it's packed with people. Like A breakfast republic? Yeah. yeah. That's a – and I'm thinking, shouldn't you be working? <laughs> you, know, so, you know, a group of five, six people just sitting around talking, like, you should be working. I do not understand that location because I know Breakfast Republic is quite popular. I, right. I'm not a big go out I've to breakfast been guy. I, I've never been there. I, I've been there once or twice. I didn't think it was anything special and don't mean to offend anybody there, but yeah. it, it was okay. It's your opinion. It's okay. I don't understand that location because it's in Scripps Ranch. Like, it's not in a touristy area. Like, you know, I know there's one in Pacific Beach where, yeah, right. people might be out on vacation. You go there. But that one's in the Well, well of- maybe, maybe this week you and I on, I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, 1030, we'll go over there to uh, have breakfast and we'll see, hey, what are you doing here at 1030 in the morning? It's like, why? What, what, is that your, what, what's business is that of yours? Yeah. Like, well, we do a radio show. We want to talk about it. So, but um, anyways, we digress quite a bit there. But uh, l- let's go back to the jobs report. What I want to talk about, too, is a JOLTS report, which came out early in the week, which really caused havoc with the 10-year Treasury. Uh, The JOLTS report showed job openings rose by nearly 700,000 in the month of August to 9.61 million. This easily topped the estimate of 8.8 million. It means there are still 1.5 jobs available for each unemployed worker. Now, layoffs, they also remain low at just 1.7 million. While this is a positive for the labor market, again, this showed the concerns 
that there is a tight labor market that could pressure the Fed to continue its tightening policy. I, I do believe there are other factors on the inflation front that should lead to stabilization from the Fed rather than that continued increase, as we've kind of discussed. But the unfortunate part is the positive news in the labor market has continued to push Treasuries higher. And the 10-year Treasury actually pushed past, I think we said, what, 4.8% at its yeah. peak now mm-hmm. to reach its highest level since 2007. I mean, I mean, it's definitely a lot higher than people anticipated, I'm going to say. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is happening, too, is that yield curve is flattening out. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this is going to be a positive in 2024. My feeling is I believe the 10-year Treasury will stay between 45 to maybe 5%. I think it'll be in that, that range there. But on the shorter end, you're going to see that come down. Right now, we'll say it's around 4 to 5. I think you'll be seeing 3 to 4. So these people are all excited about those six-month T-bills at 5%. Yeah. Guess what? Next time you renew those, they're not going to be that percent. And we'll get back to a normal yield curve as opposed to the inverted yield curve. And, and it's flattening out quite a bit when you look at it now. Yeah, I mean, especially when you looked at it when rates were, you know, the Fed's funds rates and the the you know the three month six months treasuries yeah. you, you could get you know I'm gonna say five percent and the the ten year was still at four percent well now as you said I mean the the, the two year and the shorter term rates haven't really gone up that much and the ten year has gone from you know about four percent now to gosh close to five percent I mean it, it's really changed quite dramatically which has flattened the curve and and the thing that I find interesting is I know financials have really been getting beaten up I think this is a huge positive for oh, them yeah. Yeah. because they're now being able to invest that money in higher interest rate producing assets, loan out money on you know mortgages, mm-hmm. car loans, whatever it may be, at higher interest rates, and not having that shorter term pressure on you know their deposits and paying up for those. I I, I think I'm gonna say the market's wrong on that. I, I think the financials are are a great place to be looking. The right financials, uh, given this environment, and, and financials are a more conservative investment, but they do get hurt when rates go yep. up. But rates don't go up forever. You know, and especially now, and you look at our inflation rate, you look at what's going on with the economy. Uh, we're at the higher end. Uh, I, I think, I'd say close to the peak for inflation, uh, not for inflation, but for interest rates. The so peak for inflation was last, what? <laughs> last year. <laughs> last year. Um, but that's a big positive for financials. And also, too, is people get used to this. Because right now, people, and they, they still want to buy a house, but there's other things that they want to buy. Well, I'm going to wait to see what happens. And once things stabilize, that's why we don't need rates to go down just stabilize to know that they're not going up, people will start spending again and banks will do well. And, and especially on the bank front, I, I know there's a lot of banks and you know, I'm, I'm going to pick on Charles Schwab. They, they got hit pretty hard because of their balance sheet. And they're like, oh, they have so many securities on mm-hmm. there that you know they're technically underwater because if you look at their held as maturity portfolio, well, you don't really have to mark that down. But what happens is, yeah, you might have bought a 10-year treasury at 1.2%. Yes. <laughs> Terrible investment. They shouldn't have done that, in, in my opinion. But what's happening now is they're going to start over the next year, two years, three years, you're going to start to have those longer-dated treasuries that they had purchased at really low rates roll off. Yep. And now what do they get to do? Now they get a buy at, you know, maybe it's not 4.8%, right. but we'll, we'll even call it 4.5%. Because I don't think the 10-year Treasury is going back down to 3.5% within the next couple of years even. I, I think you're going to see the 10-year note at around 4 4.5% perhaps for the next few years. I, I think that's a very realistic expectation. And, and even they will appreciate uh, when the rates go back down a little bit mm-hmm. because, yeah, they, they went down, but even though they're way underwater – they will get some gains on those as they recover some of that. So yeah. that, that's why you can't make that, – that's why trading the market doesn't make any sense because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and you can be so wrong uh, so quickly and never recover. But when you're doing the way we invest money, it's like, no, we know we're going through a hard time, but we'll get through this because this will change. And all of a sudden, oh, we look like the heroes. Yeah. So it, you've got to be patient when it comes into investing. And a patient investor is not – an investor for two, three months. It, it's two to three years. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have, I, I'm going to say right now, 2022 and 2023, even they've been very, very challenging years for oh, yeah. investors. Yeah. But this is when people, they just do the silliest things. They, they sell out and they're like, oh, I can again get that 5% yeah. six month T bill, we'll call <laughs> it. And then all of a sudden things go up 10, 15%. And you're like, oh my gosh, how did I miss out on that? Well, because you panicked and you sold. And historically, you look after periods like this, after a two-year difficult period. Right. Well, generally, things do recover long term. (laughs) And you're a fool if you sell out now 
and then all of a sudden you don't get back in over the next five years because the same thing that's pressuring you doesn't lead you back in. I I try to be nicer and not call people foolish. I try to say it's not a wise decision. Yeah. Yeah, try to be nicer on that one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and I've been doing this for 40 years, and I've seen people not make that wise decision, and then they regret it later on. You know, we talk about it here on the radio show. We talk about our newsletter. I'll talk about it tomorrow morning on KSI because we're trying to get investors. And again, you've got to have the right investments. We're not saying if you have some cryptocurrency or some other crazy thing you should hold on. We're talking about if you've got good quality investments that are at reasonable valuations, you should not be getting out of that investment, especially, you know, right now some of the dividends are, are 3 4%, some even higher. Why would you sell that? Because, oh, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get worse. We get a lot of good things. We talk about the job report. Yeah. That is good. So... Uh, we got an election coming up next year. So, you know, in, investors, you just got to be patient with the right qualities, what you have to do. Yeah. So, all right, well, we'll t- talk about crazy. Let's talk about oil prices because we have seen a dramatic rise in gas at the pump, which has been caused by rising price of oil. Just a couple of months ago, at the beginning of July, oil was at $71 per barrel. It has increased substantially and in, in September at $91 a barrel. Yes, that is a, a 20, 28.2% increase. At the end of September, we also saw the U.S. commercial crude inventories at their lowest level since December of 2022. And before you jump to conclusions and think that gas prices are going to continue to rise, let me give you some fundamentals behind the scenes. And because of rising prices on gasoline, consumption is actually declining. And if prices were to hit $100 a barrel, let's say, well, that would cause a further decrease in consumption. Now, you have to remember as well, as a world world market and China has built up over the last three years a very large inventory of oil, which they acquired at low prices. This means they likely will not be coming back into the market since they have more than an adequate supply. Also, if oil were to hit $100 per barrel, that could bring more inventory online and increasing the supply. And also, it is possible that Saudi Arabia would bring back some of their production that they took offline earlier this year and said, hey, you know, $100 a barrel, we'll, yeah. we'll sell some there. Yeah. That's pretty profitable. Now, keep in mind, an unexpected supply shock would cause oil prices to continue to rise. Barring that scenario, I do believe that we should be close to the top here at, again, around $100 a barrel. And actually, we saw, I think it was just yesterday, Thursday, all of a sudden, that oil went back from 90 back down around 82. Mm-hmm. Um, for these reasons, it can happen very quickly. When when we, we wrote this, we're just looking at, you know, could be a day, a week, a month, uh, two months, but it causes when prices go up. People pull back on the spending, and the producers say, wow, we, we can now make a lot more money. Let's produce some more oil now at $100 a barrel. When it goes back down, we can always cut it back. But it's just, it's again, the supply-demand forces is what drives it. Don't get so upset and think it's going to last forever because that's not going to happen. And I remember, what was it, when the Russia-Ukraine war started, mm-hmm. I remember there were calls that oil is going to go to $150 a barrel. Oh, yeah, it's Maybe right. even higher. Yeah. And, and it... it just didn't come to fruition because again, there'll be people there willing to sell oil at a hundred dollars a barrel. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's Amazing. a pretty good profit there. And you know, I was gonna say it's funny when um, you know I was in Europe and I, I was telling you I got home last night. And I was like, what? Six dollars a gallon? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going up, but I didn't realize it was that high here in San Diego. I was like, geez. But in Europe, it's worse. I mean, I was talking to a gentleman there, and because they do it per liter, so I was kind of like, what's the the conversion Pleasure. there? And he, he said it's about. Eight to ten dollars a gallon is what they pay in Europe. I was like, "Oh, yikes!" Yeah, and it's just uh, crazy. And people, uh, you know, some of our posts that we do, like, "Oh, we want to be a socialist. We want to be more like Europe." Like, really? I, I don't want to pay eight dollars a gallon. I mean, I'm I'm not happy paying six dollars a gallon. Yeah. So, and a lot of ours is taxes, but over there, same thing. A lot of taxes. Mm-hmm. So. Phone numbers here. You want to join the show? Got a, a company you're looking at investing or holding or buying, selling? Uh, Going to open the phone lines 833 288 0973. That's 833 288 0973. And as always, gets you through for that unbiased, no strings attached, fundamental opinion about what you want to talk about. Well, Chase, let's talk about investment returns because last week in a newsletter, we said that we see a very good fourth quarter for investors as it could produce some good fourth quarter investment returns. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, known as a PCE, was released and came out at 0.4% last month. Core prices, which exclude food and energy, rose 0.1%, which is the weakest monthly increase since 2020. If you look at June through August of this year, 
core prices only increased at 2.2% on an annualized basis, which is very close to the Fed's 2% target. Based on this data, I do believe the Federal Reserve, once again, will pause at the the meeting in October here. I'm seeing no indication of rising inflation overall. Even with the increase in prices at the pump, I do believe there will be another positive PC report released about a month from, uh, gosh, last week. And now... And then no increases in interest rates once again in December. If you agree with that data, you should not be sitting on much cash or short term investments that pay 4 to 5%. You should be investing that money in good quality equities, or else again, you'll be scratching your head in January on what you missed out on. And the thing you have to understand as well is that 2.2% annualized rate that we're talking about, that's not looking at year over year. Right. What that <clears throat> should mean is next year, barring again any type of major supply shock, we should see if things remain constant that PCE rate fall down around that two and a half percent, I'm gonna call it rate, just naturally, without increasing interest yep. rates. So that's why I just cannot see why they would increase rates further. Yeah, I, I, I don't get it either. So uh, all this information does come from a newsletter. goes out every Friday. There's a lot more there on the newsletter. We also talk about uh, Social Security, a solution to insolvency, the gun tax, electric vehicle demand, Bitcoin, many different things there. You want the free newsletter, you can sign up at our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. Just go right to the middle, see the newsletter, sign up for it. You'll get every Friday in your your uh, email uh, in basket there. All right, phone numbers here again, 833-288-0973. Again, that's 833-288-0973. And we do get uh, questions on uh, investing through our, our newsletter, uh, not through our newsletter, through our website. If you want to do that as well, you can contact us at the website, uh, again, smartinvesting2000.com and send a question that way. Well, we got one from a, a Barbara here saying, hi, Brent, just want to take a look at what you think about the portfolio or stocks or the value of Darden Restaurant Group. Uh, they just acquired Ruth Chris Steakhouse in addition to their other restaurants such as Olive Garden, Eddie V's and Yard House Cheddars, uh, Bahama Breeze, and maybe there's another one. Anyway, let me know what you think of the future value of Darn Stocks. Uh, thanks, uh, as always. All right, so let's take a look. At, you know, she did not give me the symbol. Do you have the symbol? It's DRI. DRI. Okay, let me wake up my computer here uh, and put that in there. Uh, because, you know, and, and the restaurant industry is something that does kind of excite me a little bit. So I'm kind of happy to look at this. But I also know we got to talk about what everybody's talking about with this new drug with people not eating as much. So <laughs> is that going to hurt the restaurants? Well, let's look at the numbers first. And I am surprised. Well, uh, again, Darden Restaurant, symbol DRI. Uh, there is 8.2% short on the float. I'm kind of surprised on that. That's fairly high. Usually it's uh, for a normal company around 1% to 2%. Uh, 95% institutional owned. Now, last reported period is already August 31st, so these are pretty good numbers. P.E. ratio looking good for Darden, 17 versus 26.5. Price to sales, 1.6 versus 2.6. Price to book value, 7.7 versus 22.8. And price to cash flow, 12.1 versus 17.3. Valuation ratios, you always want them lower than the industry. We have that with Darden Restaurant. Also have a good peg ratio. You want this lower as well, 1.7 versus 5.8. Now, their earnings per share of the last year were up 11.7%, which is very reasonable, but the industry shows an increase of 33.3%. Sales for Darden increased by 10.3% when the industry was up only 57 so positive there. The analysts do see a five-year growth rate on Darden, 9.5%, which I think is pretty good. Not as good as the industry at 121 but still, I'll take a 9.5. They do pay a nice dividend here, 3.7%, and only use 61% of their earnings to pay that out. Taking a look at the balance sheet, uh, got a problem here. Current ratio, 0.4 versus 1.2. I, I, I don't like seeing that, especially with the debt to equity in 2.5 versus 1. This could cause a liquidity problem to where they can't pay their debt. And all of a sudden, the creditors start coming in saying, we want our money now. So I do not like seeing a current ratio of 0.4 with a dead 2.5, that could be a, a a barrier right there. I would not want to take on. Look at the net profit margin, 9.1 versus 9.6. That's pretty good. Return on equity, 45.8 versus 14. Uh, and, and the return on invested capital, 14.1. I, I kind of stumbled on that return on equity of 45.8. What that tells me is they may have very low equity. 
So maybe the debt is not that bad. So you really got to do some analysis on this further, but you got more going forward here. What I was going to say, too, it, it's something that I've looked at before with restaurant companies yeah. is I don't know the model for Darden, but I know like if you look at balance sheets for uh, – actually, I'm going to go back to a company that we looked at was IHOP and Applebee's. Yeah. We looked at them several years ago. We ended up uh, buying them, uh, and I'm blanking on the, the, the name of the actual holding company for those two, but they're what we call asset light because they run a franchise model yeah. where they don't actually really own anything. They just have the – I'm going to say the IP for the, the companies, right. and then they have different franchise owners that actually operate the restaurant, so they don't really have as much going on in the operation side of things, but it always begs the question, why do they have that much debt then? Right, you know, it's something that you really have to look at and analyze. Is Darden the same thing where they mostly franchise based, where they're not owning the restaurants, they're working with franchisees that own the restaurants. So that'd be something you'd have to understand. And the other thing I look at too is, you know, maybe they don't own much much real estate. So if you don't own the real estate, you don't have that kind of equity in the assets yeah. there that really offsets it. So just some considerations. But looking at the numbers here for again, Darden Restaurants Group ticker symbol DRI. Current price is one hundred thirty-six dollars and ninety-four cents. I see the fifty-two week low here is one hundred twenty-four dollars and eighty-two cents, and the fifty-two week high well, that's one hundred seventy-three dollars and six cents. I do see year to date the stock is uh, I'm gonna say close to flat. It's only down about two percent for the full year, so it, it's hovering around that flat line. If we go out to May two thousand twenty-five, I do see the company has an estimated earnings per share of nine dollars and sixty-three cents. That gives it a target sell price of one hundred fifty-nine dollars. And 86 cents. So it trades at a four PE of about 14, 14.25, it looks like. So not a huge estimated gain here. It'd actually be in our hold category as it'd be less than 30% away from its target sell price. Yeah, and, and you'd want to wait for this to come down a little bit or see the earnings go up in uh, their fiscal year. So what, May 2025? So that's not going to change for a while. Uh, what could happen here? And I've been thinking about this. Now, this, this diet drug. I believe it's $1,000 a week or $1,000 a month. Either way, that's prohibitive for many people. Now, I, I understand that if you have, I think, diabetes or heart situation, your insurance company may, you know, may pay for it. But a lot of these people that want to get it now, they may pay $1,000 a week or $1,000 a month for a while, but they can't pay for it for the rest of life. And eventually, it's going to be like anything else to where... You go off the drug, oh, I'm hungry again. I'm going to go back and eat a lot. I wonder if it could be like emotional support dogs where before it was supposed to be kind of like, you know, only oh, if you truly needed yeah. it. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, no, it's like I, I'm depressed. And you just sign something and you don't really have to verify anything. And now you get an emotional support dog. I wonder if a similar situation could happen here with the diet drug. But the other thing is kind of reversing that to the restaurants is maybe that'll be good for restaurants because maybe they won't have to lower prices, but they serve less food. (laughs) (laughs) They maintain their margin, actually increase margins potentially on each particular dish. But well, you lose out on appetizers, dessert, and that's what I was gonna like say. Because because I'm I'm older now, I can't eat like I like I used to. So now when I go like went to the winery last night, our favorite restaurant UTC, um, went there last night, and it's like I was looking at the appetizers. Like if I have an appetizer, I probably won't have a dessert. So, but you know what? I think I did have an appetizer, and I still have a dessert. <laughs> so I, uh, just through my whole theory out. <laughs> but but if you're on but the on diet, the diet drug, you'll do that. <laughs> you'll, you'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was just such a great dinner last night. Like everything was great, um, but you, you, and that's what I think about. And it, you brought up a point that I didn't even think of because you're right. Because oh, I'm so depressed because I'm so overweight. Oh, well, emotionally, if we give you this diet drug, you can. Go, you can. What is that going to do with the insurance companies? I don't know. That that that's going to be, uh, and and the the emotional support do- dogs. I I kind of get it. But gosh, this this thing with the I just know there's a lot of abuse in the system, which yeah. doesn't surprise me, and I, I could see a similar situation happening yeah. here with the drug. And that could be a huge abuse because there's a lot more people that uh, would need the diet drug for that than I think would want the emotional support dog. I will say as well, the big difference is I don't believe insurance companies dole out for emotional support dogs. I don't think they have to pay for those emotional support oh, dogs. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. But yeah. even then, it, it's you know maybe a couple hundred dollars 
right for the cost where this is again very cost prohibitive from the insurance side it, it's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on as it, it, it could have a, a large impact on as you said health insurers right could have a large impact on food companies restaurants things like that frankly I don't think it's going to change a whole lot. I could mm-hmm. be wrong on that. I, I'm not going to do any swing trades around this whole uh, <laughs> concept, but it, it's something that I think is uh, getting a lot of news attention that I, I don't see make having any major headwinds. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it'll be a, a long-term thing where like in you know three years, everybody in America is you know, slim and fit because of diet drug. I, I think it's like going to be like a fad now. People want it. Uh, but people also like to eat and socialize and, and, you know, like, and we like to eat and, and well, I can't eat now because I'm on this drug and yeah, I look good, but gosh, I really want to have that dessert cause it looks yeah. really good too. So I, it, it could be an overblown situation. It'll have some effect, but I, I, I still think people go out and socialize and, and enjoy eating and drinking. And it's just, you know, yeah, I mean, I know America's overweight right now, but, um, I don't think it's gonna have that big of an effect to where all of America in five years is going to be slim and fit. So. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I'd, I'd say I'd, I'd pass on DART. And I, I think as yeah. well, just, I think it got a lot of benefit when the service side of the economy was really booming. I, I think things have kind of cooled off a little bit in terms of the growth that we're going to see year over mm-hmm. year in terms of restaurant and bar spending. So, I, I, I'm i a little hesitant to jump into anything in that space because I don't think the valuation is clearly at you know, we put in the hold category, are that attractive? I, I would have liked to buy a company like this during COVID when nobody was Wanted going it. And to we looked the at them, but we, we just, we did a lot of buying during COVID. We, we couldn't buy everything because yeah. it was great, but this would have been a, a great one as well. And and a pullback on this could be a, a time, but right now, again, a hold category. And um, I was kind of hoping it would be, because I like EDVs as well. And um, I know they have this place called Capital Grill, which uh, my older sister who lives up in um, Costa Mesa really likes too. So really? they have some, yeah. yeah, they have some good restaurants yeah. there. And again, good point being, and is Ruth like, Chris is my favorite. Yeah, Ruth Chris. Oh, that's right, Ruth Chris. Um, and uh, point being is that, yeah, we like the the restaurant, we like what they have, but it's just not a good time to buy it. So be patient there. All right, phone numbers here eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. That's eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Uh, I looked at the clock, and I see that our financial planner, Harrison Johnson, is here. So let's go to Harrison, uh, Dwayne in San Diego. Be patient. We'll get to you. You call him. We'll get to you as well. But uh, Harrison, uh, how you doing? Good morning, guys, and uh, welcome back, Chase. Good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see today you're talking about Social Security and a solution to the insolvency. Can you call President Biden on this and tell him what's going on? Yeah, um, I've got him on speed dial, so you know, he's <laughs> so, <laughs> um, But so, yeah, it's it's well known that Social Security Trust Fund is running out of money. It's projected that the program will be insolvent in about 10 years, at which point beneficiaries would only receive 80 percent of their expected benefits. Now, I, I think this is unlikely to actually come to fruition. There's going to be changes, no doubt, but I don't think, you know, nothing's going to happen over the 10 years and then, you know, benefits are just going to be cut by 20 percent. Um, but we will definitely see some changes. Um, and most proposals to fix this problem involve either an increase to taxes or a decrease in benefits in some capacity um, because Social Security by law can only invest in U.S. Treasuries and cannot borrow any money to um, fix the insolvency issues. So over the last few years, U.S. Senators Bill Cassidy and Angus King, who sit on opposite sides of the aisle, have been working on an alternative solution. And it is creative, to say the least. So the idea is the federal government would borrow $1.5 trillion over a five-year time frame and then an unrelated third party investment group would invest those funds for the next 75 years. In the meantime, the Social Security insolvency would be financed with additional government borrowing. And then after that 75 years, the accumulated investment principal would repay the one and a half trillion that was borrowed plus any additional borrowing and accumulated interest over that time. And then the remaining balance would go to the Social Security Trust Fund. Now, over any 75-year period, the U.S. stock market has always far outpaced the return of U.S. Treasuries. So in theory, this would solve the issue without tax increases or benefit cuts.
this borrow to invest strategy. It's called a pension obligation bond. Um, it's pretty frowned upon for government agencies. And between the borrowing, the investing, not to mention government corruption thrown in there, um, <laughs> there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, so, And a failure on a program as large as Social Security would be catastrophic for American taxpayers and, and the country as a whole. So it, I, I wanted to talk about this just because I thought it was interesting. It, it's creative. It would be nice to come up with a way to um, fix the problem without dra- dramatically increasing taxes or, or cutting benefits. But borrowing money so that it can be invested and then paid back, um, I mean, it, it, just, it seems like there's there's a lot of things that could be mishandled or, or go wrong over that. And one thing, too, that I look at is <clears throat> I didn't like that they have a third-party manager or select amount of third-party managers that would be, I mean, yeah, what, are I they going to call that. Nancy Pelosi's husband and have right. him do it? That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I was waiting for our phone call. <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to say, how do you get that kind of gig? And I, I thought of Nancy Pelosi's husband, too. It's like, well, um, maybe we throw in some insider trading, and that'll actually be a really good deal for everybody. <laughs> I mean, in theory, I, 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 I'm glad you brought this up because I, I was reading about it the other day, and I just I, – I, I think there's some really good ideas. And personally, you know, we're not big advocates of the S&P 500. That I wouldn't even do the S&P 500. I would do the equal weight S&P 500. I don't yeah. think it's the best thing to invest in, but I think long term that's going to be, again, low cost. It's not going to have, you know – uh, the same type of returns as bonds, I think it would outperform it, and you wouldn't have necessarily that risk of fraud right. by choosing a you know third party manager that is just buddy buddy with you know uh, you know some people in government that could cause a lot of issues. But I think it's just so wrong that we don't invest in stocks because it hurts the <clears> overall <throat> per- performance in the long term. Yeah, and and and, and the, the, you're right. There's so much chance of fraud on that that you get the wrong person. And also, 75 years is a long time. <laughs> Things can change a lot. Yeah. Where And we're not big advocates of the index, but you do in the index, there's really no chance of fraud. Just put in the index and just let it go for 75 years. The downside is that, yeah, you borrow the – government's going to borrow $1.5 trillion because they don't have $1.5 trillion in cash. Well, they got to pay interest on that over 75 yeah. years. So it, it may not turn out you know as great as we think, <clears throat> but I, but I like the idea that they're trying to do something different. I just I don't understand why we don't look at saying let's let's even start investing twenty percent, and then uh, I'm going to say it's kind of like how we right. do our income portfolio at our, our firm is that we keep some liquid and in, in you know I'm going to say a little bit higher income producing assets which you know the government can do and then a portion set that aside and invest that that won't need to be touched for two three four years let that just invest and grow but it's maybe that makes too much sense i don't know probably the problem makes too much sense yeah so well harrison i i mean that's a uh, i'm I'm glad you bring that to the forefront here for people to kind of look at and something will be done i don't i don't think it's going to be this this plan unfortunately i think there's some merit to that one but um I, I think what's probably going to happen is going to raise taxes, lower benefits, and extend the life of uh, – or extend when you can actually collect Social Security. Or what could happen is you don't have to necessarily follow the trust fund. You just keep spending deficits. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it's the, the issue is it's such a large deficit to overcome, which yeah. in this program, you know, the repayment doesn't come after 75 years, but insolvency happens in 10 years. So that means for 65 years, the deficit is just, you know, covered by additional government borrowing. So the amount of principal to pay off would be massive. Um, and then, you know, whatever happens to interest rates in the meantime, um, not to mention it, you know, to for the government to keep up with those interest payments um, on the money that they borrow, that could re, uh, result in additional taxes other places to maintain that debt. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to solve this problem without raising taxes, but it could just cause an increase in taxes to pay the additional debt um, because of the accumulated interest. So, again, it's it's creative. Um, I do like the idea of trying to get some type of investment in there, but I think you're right, Brad. I, I think even if some type of investment is factored in, there's likely going to be a change to taxes and change to um, benefits in, in some capacity. Yeah. All right. Well, Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, you have a great Saturday, and we'll see you on see you on Monday. All right. Thanks, guys. See you Monday. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, that is Harrison Johnson, our financial planner. He is a fee-based planner. He's on a salary. He does not sell any products or 
uh, try to get any fee based or any commission uh, based products to, to make a commission on. Uh, you want a free consultation with him? Uh, go to our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. You can also come at the office at 858 546 4306. That's 858 546 4306. And have a time to set up a consultation with him. All right, phone number is here 833 288. 0973. That's 833 Let's go to San Diego and speak with Dwayne. Dwayne, you're on the Smart Invest Show, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Did we lose Dwayne? Uh, Dwayne. Uh, maybe you're on mute. Can you hear me? Oh, there, there you are. Is. There you are, Dwayne. How you doing? Uh, doing okay. How are you? Sorry Good. about that. No problem. No problem. Uh, yeah, I was interested in uh, looking at, or I, ha- I have a stock. It's Medical Properties Real Investment Trust, uh, symbol MPW, and I'm trying to figure out, do I keep it or do I sell it? Okay. Well, let's look at, uh, a look at uh, MPW, and again, it's a, a real estate investment trust, and because of the big increase recently with the 10-year treasury, virtually all REITs have been beaten up because of the funding, the way they actually fund the, the real estate, so that's one reason that you'll see a lot of these just getting beaten up. But let's take a closer look at, again, uh, MPW, which is the Medical Property Trust. Uh, that is just symbol MPW. They're in the real estate investment trust healthcare facilities industry. There's a high short on this of 31.4%, 78% institutional owned. Uh, we do see a PE ratio of 46.3, which is high, but the industry is at 393. Price of sales 2.2, half the industry at 4.4. Wow, love this book value. And this is price to tangible book value. It means you take all the intangible assets. It is 0.4. So that means for the tangible assets of this company, this real estate investment trust, you're paying 40 cents on the dollar versus 8.9 for the industry. Price of cash flow, 5 versus 14.8. So valuation ratios look very good for MPW. We do see earnings per share over the last year are down 97%, but the industry is down 96%. Sales are down about 9.6%. The industry is up 28.1%. So you want to find out Why are the sales down for Medical Property Trust? We do see a five-year growth rate, which is not looking good for MPW. It's a negative 9.4 versus a positive 21%. Now, the dividend yields, I don't believe this reflects the cut because they did cut their dividend, I think, a month or two ago. Uh, But it shows here a 20% yield with a payout ratio of 1,054. So some crazy numbers here that you're getting from this. And Chase will go over the um, uh, the uh, FFOs for you, which is a little bit different. Uh, we do see, uh, let's see, the, the debt situation. Current ratio 0.9 versus 2.1. That's okay. And debt to equity not on a line at 1.3 versus 1.1. Net profit margin 5.1 versus 1.5%. That means for every dollar they bring in, they're still making five cents on that dollar. Return on equity is low, 0.9. Uh, return on investment capital is low, also 2.4. But again, being a real estate investment trust, you want to look at other factors, which Chase will do for us now. Yeah, and real quick, I, I do see here uh, on our other source that we use, um, it looks like the dividend going forward has been changed. So it looks like the yield is 11.76% after the That's cut. That's the real dividend going forward. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, this looked at the past. You got yeah. the four. Good. W- which is, hey, uh, that 12% oh, yeah. yield yeah. after a dividend cut. Right. I, you know, I want to look at it closer, but gosh, I would think that's a pretty secure dividend based off their cash flow. I mean, that's hard hard pressed to find a 12% yield somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But looking at the current price here for MPW, it is $5.10. I see the, the 52-week low here is $4.92, and the 52-week high here is $14. Year to date, the stock has struggled uh, immensely, uh, being down 56%. Going forward, though, and again, with REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, we look at FFO, stands for the Funds from Operations, just because a lot of Real estate, you're going to have depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. So we want to look at kind of the, the cash flow of that business when we're in, analyzing it. But we go out to December 2024. I do see estimated FFO of $1.49. It gives a target sell price here at $24.73. It's almost just head-scratching. It, it trades at 3.4 times 2024 estimated FFO. And even if you're taking account the depreciation, going out to December 2024, the mean of eight analysts say the earnings are still going to be 85 cents. 
Now, and that's a very rather tight range. I mean, the lowest amount is 79, the high is 92. So disregarding this as a REIT, they're still looking at making 85 cents will give us target sell price of what, probably 15? Mm-hmm. Um, I, no, probably about 13. I, there's just no reason for this. And I think what it is, is the company does have some debt coming up in a year or two, I believe. And they should have a lot of it covered, but they still need something else to go right for it to actually fully cover that debt. And then they do have a good chunk coming due in 2025, 2026, but I think interest rates should be in a much better spot by then. And, and, and that's what I was going to say is because the concern is like, oh, they're going to finance at a higher amount. Well, if you have debt coming due in 25, you got a whole different scenario. So it's just, and this happened to all the REITs where, oh, they got debt coming due. 10-year treasuries at 4.8%. Let's just sell this. I think they're making a big mistake because, you know, this is in hospitals, surgical centers. It's not like it's going to be replaced by AI or anything else. We we have a growing demand in that industry. So it's, it's, it's just I think it's getting beaten up so bad because of the quick move in interest rates. And I do agree that the interest expense is going to go up. There's no, there's yeah. no way to avoid that. I mean, they, right. they got interest rates for five years sometimes at you know two, three percent. Right. That's not going to happen again. But let's even say they refinance at eight percent. Well, in that meantime, they've been able to increase rent. They have many of these REITs have inflation adjusted rent agreements, which means they're able to continually increase rates. So by 2025, they're going to have an increase in rental income. Well, yeah, their interest expense will go up. But again, you're paying three times the right. FFO. Even if you put that at a normalized rate of, I'm going to say, 10 times FFO, I mean, that gives you so much of a cushion of where interest rates could be. Right. And that interest expense could grow to. That it, it's just, it makes no sense, in my opinion, that, that a company like this is trading at that low level. It, it's head scratching. Yeah. And, and Dwayne, I know it's pretty scary right now. Like, gosh, you know, it's down to like $5 and change. Like, oh, you know, I better sell. Gonna, I mean, I, I don't think it would be a wise move to do that because the fundamentals say that, no, this is not going to go down and under. It's being beaten up so bad. And, and if rates were still at back like uh, six months ago where the 10-year treasury was at, what was that, three, four, whatever, you probably wouldn't see that. So it's all based on rates, not based on what the REIT is doing. So I I, I think there there's a lot of reasons to hold on to this. And, and one thing I would love to see this company do in particular, is take that cash flow, excess cash flow that they have from the the savings on the dividend and start buying back their debt because that'll help get them ahead of the curve by 2025 that they won't have as much debt to refinance. It would clean up their balance sheet, help them with the credit agency so when they do refinance that debt, they don't have to refinance at a lower rated balance sheet, which should help with their interest rates as well. And I think it would really help the stock move if they said, yeah, we're going to start buying back our debt. Yep. So, Dwayne, I'm going to say hold tight. You'll be fine. But uh, And I, I think the worst of the storm is over. Uh, I, I, I'd have hey, to well, assume. What's that, Dwayne? Well, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for calling. You have a good one. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. That is open on the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Do you have a comment, Chase? Oh, I was just going to yeah. say, I'd have to assume that I think the, because the 10 year note has gone from, you know, <laughs> one, two percent over right. the last couple of years. Right. I, I don't foresee it doubling again to eight to 10 percent. It's not yeah. I, it, yeah. I, I, I would be shocked if that happened. It, I think it's possible to see perhaps one day it hit five percent. Yeah. Um, but going forward, I mean, it, if we get the CPI number that we think we're going to get uh, on Thursday, I, I see no reason for that to happen. Um, and, and I don't see why it would be higher because, the, you know, inflation is coming down. And, and the big part was, too, was, was you know, the, the real estate side was like 40 percent. I mean, rents have been coming down. So I think we're starting to see the benefit that we talked about six or 12 months ago. It takes 12 months for those leases expire, new leases come up. And the amount of building that's going on for the apartment, it's just amazing to me. Yeah. No, I, I'm definitely very excited and yeah. uh, interested to see what happens on Thursday. Yeah. So, all right. Phone number is 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Let's go out to San Diego and speak with Val. Val, you're in the Smart Vegetable Brent Chase. How can we help you out? Yes, I'd like to follow up with the uh, discussion you had with uh, your your financial advisor. Uh, 
the third quarter was sort of very weird in terms of trading individual stocks on on a intermediate basis and i was wondering whether a vehicle such as ftech which is a mutual fund that specializes in in uh, in nasdaq type high quality uh technical stocks whether that might be a very suitable vehicle of what you thought of its present valuation you know i think chase you you can kind of look at those i, I can't pull them up i don't think anything there but i that when you do something like this where you go to the mutual fund yes you'll be more diversified but your returns won't do as well and many times you won't do as well because they've got more bad stuff than good stuff in there and sometimes they're so diversified you can't really tell what you have hey, can you pull anything up on this one yeah Go and i mean both from a government investing in the standpoint and a personal investing in the standpoint i it, it just reminds me and yes the nasdaq has done phenomenal yeah. for the last gosh i'm gonna go back to 2009 even i mean with yeah. that 14 years it's done very very well but again i point out a time that uh, people forget about this and i i would not put too much into this again if i was a government or an individual person because it, it is very tech heavy i mean apple makes up 22 percent of the entire uh f tech fund here um microsoft's 20.2 percent of that so you have f- two companies that make up 42 percent of the entire fund here i mean it, it's just might as well just buy those two companies it, it, it's yeah very concentrated in that. I mean, the top 10 holdings is 61% of the entire uh, fund here. So I would not do that. And especially the point I was going to make here was you go back to the year 2000, that's when the NASDAQ peaked out. It took you 15 years to get back to break even. So yes, it did very well over the last 14 years, but people have a very short-term memory in how crazy tech can get and it can be very, very strong for a period of time. But all of a sudden, you can't have the inability to not make money for 15 <laughs> years. I mean, that, it's going to be very problematic. And I don't see these companies doing as well over the next 15 years as, they, as they've done over the last 14 15 years. years. Yeah, 14 years. Yeah, that's true. So I, I would I would avoid this. I think it's just going to be very, very pricey. I think, again, it, the fund has probably done very, very well, but it, it's it's basically two companies at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> All right, Val? Okay, thanks so much. All right, thanks for calling. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right, that does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Well, Chase, let's talk about something uh, different here. I'm kind of looking for the, the topic I want to talk about here, and I can't find it. Uh, you know, let, let's let's talk about the writer's strike because that, that's something here that uh, it has ha- caused some problems as well. Uh, how, how does the resolution of the writer's strike affect your consumption of entertainment? No surprise, the cost of creating shows to watch are going to go up, and how that affects you, the consumer, is two ways. First, being prepared for more increase in the cost of streaming, along with more commercials being added. Also, as the cost of the production goes up, you will find less shows will be produced as producers only try to create hits to make big money and cut costs in other areas. Now, artificial intelligence, also known as AI, was a concern for the writers and is still years away, but it will be used to brainstorm ideas, comb through script submissions, and provide building blocks for show concepts or dialogue. Humans will still be needed for the creative concepts and scripts. I believe it was just a few years ago that streaming sounded like such a great idea because of no commercials and a lower cost than cable. Not only is that going away, but you're going to see more complicated options with streaming services and add-on options for sports or other services that will raise your subscription prices. And now I'm going to say, I think you really miss your cable TV, you know. And I like the simplicity of cable TV. Um, And if you wanted to get, I'm going to say, cute with it and really cut costs, you could. But it's going to be a pain in the butt. What's that? Cut costs. Rather than having all your streaming services at once, you just pick one for the month, and then that's what you watch for that month, and then you change (laughs) I'm not going to do that because it's too much of a pain, but it it is an option for well, people. You know, and I kind of have that right now. I, I, I have uh, Paramount, Netflix, which I'm getting ready to cut because I've, I've not watched it like in a month or two. 
and I think I have Peacock. And there's like three shows I'm watching on there because I kind of get in the show and you not you don't watch it every week now. You have like sometimes two or three seasons or two or three. <laughs> so it's like, well, I get stuck in that one, so why have these others just sitting there? The thing I loved about cable was a DVR because I could watch different networks and it would save the shows so I know where I stood. And that's why I like the cable, the DVR, which on streaming, you've got four or five different ones. You forget, well, where was I on this one? And I haven't watched that yet. I mean, you got to do it manually or write it down. I don't know. Yeah. The hard part for me is the sports and CNBC because that's, you know, I watch CNBC every morning before I go to work is I, you can't just get CNBC somewhere. You right. have to get some type of subscription. So uh, I actually canceled my direct TV stream before I left. And I'm going to go on to Sling TV. That's the, the cheapest way to, to get CNBC based right. off what I've seen. And the other hard part is football. Um, I didn't get the Sunday ticket this year. I have in the past. I just haven't really been as intrigued by the NFL lately. I decided to be a Chargers fan again so I can get that via <laughs> free TV, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's it, it's hard because it, it's definitely complicated, the TV scene. Yes. It's given people more options and more flexibility, which is nice. But it, it's it, it's hard to to make the right choice, I guess, at the end of the day. And, and my feeling was in the beginning, oh, that's going to be so great with the streaming. It's going to save you a lot of money. You can cut this out because I, I, I think it's going to actually cost more money because of what we talk about. Well, yeah, I need this package to watch this and this package to do this. I want to watch. And, and it's more confusing. It, yeah. It's not where you turn on your, your, your TV with a cable there. And it's all on one thing for you. It's all over the board. I, I think it is. We'll see how it progresses. But I'm definitely spending less than what I would if I had just traditional cable. I don't know if I am or not. I, I think it's about the, maybe a little bit. It's a little um, bit less, I think. But again, I, I have been, and I use Roku, which I, yeah. I like Roku. kind of helps out a little bit. Um, but I don't have, right now, I don't have HBO Max. Uh, and there's another one I'm missing. I, right now I have like, you know, Netflix, Peacock and, and, um, uh, Paramount. Yeah. So, and I do think from an investment standpoint, I, I think it, it's going to hurt consumers a little bit, but I think it's going to be good for businesses in that space because yeah, I mean, they, they've kind of bled cash flow in that space, but now as they've grown their subscriber count and, you know, we're not big fans of Netflix, but they have done a great job. They've shown that streaming can be very profitable. Oh, now, yeah. you pay yeah. too much for Netflix's stock, but the company itself is profitable. And if you can find these companies like Warner Brothers, like Paramount, maybe even like a Peacock, they are trading at pretty attractive multiples at this point. If they can make that transition, I think they could be big, big winners over the next three to five years. Yeah, and, and you look at things like uh, a Paramount, which is extremely low right now. There, there's, I, mean, I think the market cap's around eight to nine billion dollars. It, it's been said that the value of their library, which goes back a hundred years, yeah. is worth like 30 billion dollars. So it's a crazy time. It's because of the strikes, because of, oh, the, what's going to happen with streaming? You, you know, it's a lot of value in the entertainment industry because entertainment's not going away. We are not going to stop watching movies, shows, sports, uh, it, it's going to be there. It's just how is it going to be there? Who's going to provide it? Uh, but it will always be there because we like to be entertained. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a great point. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a, a big thing people are missing out on. And, I, you know, even Warren Buffett said he didn't understand streaming and it being a profit. But I was like, but you look at Netflix and they, they have made it profitable. And it's not like they are doing anything too different compared to what Paramount and the other right. companies can offer. And, and the writers, they have a contract, but the actors, I guess, still have, don't have a contract yet. Yeah, but, but they're they saying that should the writer's contract should create framework for the actor's contract, right. hopefully. I, I thought we were close, but I haven't heard anything about a couple I, days. So, I yeah, either. So. I was going to say as well, just on the inflation front, I think sure. we have a couple minutes or a couple seconds here. Was AI and other technological adva advancements should also help with inflation over the next few years? So I hope the Fed is kind of taking that into account. Yeah, hopefully they do. All right. Well, there's a closing bell. Thank you for the listening to Smart Investing Show. It is for informational purpose only and should not be used as investment advice. If you'd like to discuss in more detail your investment needs or have other investment questions, feel free to call myself Brent Wilsey or Chase Wilsey at eight five eight. 
888-546-4306. And be sure to visit our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. A lot of great information there. Uh, thanks for listening to our investing show. We'll be back next week. I find it all so amusing to think that I did all that. And may I say, I 